We are really lucky to have this next speaker join us today. Um, this is a guy who has really put himself on the line to bring science into the public arena in a way that makes it understandable and therefore that much more threatening uh, to those who are dependent on selling these materials and those who are using the materials. Uh, Tyrone Hayes, who is a professor of uh, evolutionary bi biology, I guess that's a, your degree from Harvard, a PhD in integrated biology uh, from the University of California, is a PhD, sorry, but evolutionary biology from Harvard. Um, he is a professor now at Berkeley, and he has published over 40 papers and 150 abstra abstracts. And I know and have seen him talk to state legislatures all over the country. I have seen him over at EPA. I have seen him trying to bring the, and bringing the message quite effectively to decision makers all over the place. Tyrone has said, and I'll quote him here, I have come to realize that the most important environmental factors affecting amphibian development are synthetic chemicals such as pesticides that interact with hormones in a variety of ways to alter developmental responses. And with that, I turn the podium over to you, Tyrone. Thank you so much for being here. I'm, I'm short too, so I'll stay down here. Um, and, and I don't know, we're kind of off on the time, so just throw a brick at me when I'm done. <laughs> What I, what I usually do is I usually call this thing that I give from Silent Spring to Silent Night, A Tale of Toads and Men. I think we came up with a different title for today's, but I'll explain what this title is all about. It's one of my favorites. Before I do, as always, and I'll shoot right through this, I always give my acknowledgments, my thank yous first, because I am nothing without the list of people that I'm about to present to you now. As always, my first thank you is to my wife and my son and my daughter for their love and support to my family at large for a lifetime of love and support, to my funders, because it takes a lot of money to do research. And this is also my disclosure. I have worked for one of the big, with four, one of the big five, Novartis, Syngenta. Um, but as you can guess, they, they don't really hang out with me so much anymore. All of my students, my current laboratory, and for their work, they're the ones who do the work. I just go around talking about it. And finally, this is dedicated to my grandmother, who was like a third parent for me. She was the one who passed on to me, before she passed on, her love of teaching and her desire to make the world a better place. So, to my grandmother. So I'm just going to cut right to the chase. I feel like this is, one of those, this is one of those conferences where I'm speaking to the choir. Nobody needs to be convinced that there's a problem. So I won't convince you of why you need to think about the problem. I'll just jump right in. I study frogs. And we heard, you know, in fact, most of my talk has already been given today. You'll, you'll see slides and hear things that you've already heard. Um, you've already heard what hormones are from one of the previous talks. And my work, my interests focus on the role of hormones in frogs. And I got thrown into this pesticide thing because I got asked by Novartis to study this chemical atrazine. It's an S-chlorotriazine. <clears throat> so you've seen a few molecules today. Here's my molecule. It's an herbicide or weed killer that's mostly used on corn in this country. It's been used since 1958 and we use 80 million pounds a year. I'll make one correction from an earlier talk. It's no longer the number one selling weed killer because of GM, glyphosate or Roundup has, has topped atrazine over the last 10 years. Um, it's used in more than 80 countries, and this is one of my favorite little slides. It's outlawed in all of Europe, and I leave this up there because it really pisses off their lawyers. Like, I keep getting letters saying it has not been outlawed in all of Europe. It has been denied regulatory approval by the European Union. <laughs> Again, I'm not sure what the difference is. All I know is that this one pisses them off, so, that's, so I leave it as it is. So what I got asked to do by the company, and I'd never heard of atrazine, is I got asked to ask whether or not atrazine interferes with frog hormones. And I knew quite a bit about frog hormones. <clears throat> I got asked to do that using the African clawed frog, because the African clawed frog is like the frog that everybody uses in the laboratory to study development for a very interesting reason. Who's ever heard of the African clawed frog Xenopus? Well, it's used in laboratories for a very interesting reason that, that I'm going to share with you historically. In 1920, somebody discovered that the human pregnancy hormone, HCG, will make this frog lay eggs. So by 1940, this was the pregnancy test. 
If you thought you were pregnant, you'd go to the doctor, they'd inject some urine into the frog, and if it laid eggs, as I always tell people, you were either happy or sad, depending on your situation. And I tell the story, I share the story for a couple of reasons. One is it shows the value of basic research, right? So somebody had to wonder, what will happen if I inject pee into a frog? I'm not sure how that ever got discovered. <laughs> somebody wondered and somebody did it. The second reason I tell this story is it shows you, and you've already heard this, how similar our hormones are to frog hormones. Okay, so things that affect frogs will very likely affect us. Maybe at different doses, maybe different routes of exposure, but it's a pretty good guess if it screws up the frog. You know, as I said, this is a tale of toads and men. The other reason I tell this story is because of that old pregnancy test, we can get our old frogs really cheap because after the pregnancy test, for other t tests developed, people just threw the frogs out. So you can go to San Diego and collect African clawed frogs. So as I usually tell people, I guess technically we're using African-American clawed frogs because they've been living there <laughs> for quite some time. So while working for the company, we discovered that atrazine decreased or inhibited the growth of the voice box of the larynx in male frogs. And that's bad news because males have deeper voices, men have deeper voices than women because of testosterone. And for the same reason, male frogs sing and females don't. And so these data suggested that atrazine was somehow demasculinizing, or I like to use the term chemically castrating, because that pisses them off more, chemically castrating these frogs. We did some very early studies, and this is my work all the way back from 2002, where, we, of course, we looked at the gonads, which you've already heard about earlier today, to ask what might be the cause of this decreasing testosterone. And we showed that some of these exposed individuals, exposed as tadpoles, so this one's a male, it has testis that we've dissected out, but then it has ovaries, then it has another testis, then it has more, it's like a whole party going on in there, right? You don't even have to, you don't even have to leave home. And then I put this slide up, I've, I've actually gotten criticized for, for this because people think I'm making some kind of, it's not any kind of judgment. My only point is that no frogs are naturally hermaphroditic. Males are males and females are females. That's not a judgment on anything. There's, not, there's no other slander in there. And the reason I feel like I have to point it out is I've been giving this talk for about 10 years and somebody always asks, aren't frogs naturally hermaphroditic? Because we've all seen the movie and read the book Jurassic Park. And in Jurassic Park, the frog DNA made the dinosaurs change sex. So that, that's science fiction. Frogs are not naturally hermaphroditic. So then we made a proposal that what was happening was, and we actually had some, some data from my, old, from my good colleague, Lou Gillette, who had worked on alligators to support this. So we proposed that what was happening in these animals is that males are supposed to make testosterone. This word, for those of you who are into words, testosterone literally means testicular hormone. It's two words stuck together, so it's the male hormone. And our proposal was that atrazine turned on aromatase, and aromatase is the enzyme that converts testosterone into estrogen. Estrogen is the female hormone. It literally means generator of estrus. And so the idea was that when these males are exposed developmentally, their testosterone is being used up, which demasculinizes them. Their larynx, their voice box doesn't grow. And they're also feminized because now they're making the female hormone, so they'll do things like grow ovaries and some other things I'll show you. <clears throat> so in that first early paper, we were able to show that. So here's control males, unexposed. Here's atrazine-treated males, and here's females. So if you give these guys atrazine, they have testosterone levels that aren't different from a female. So then we, we published a paper, and I should point out, I'm sort of telling the story chronologically. By now, I'm coming up for tenure. The paper is published in PNAS. Do you know PNAS? Proceedings at the National Academy of Science. It was a big deal. And, and hermaphroditic, demasculinized frogs after exposure to the herbicide atrazine at low ecologically relevant doses. It was a big deal to get this published. Um, as important as it was for my career, though, and for figuring out what atrazine was capable of, there were a few questions that were left unanswered. So, for example, we didn't know if the hermaphrodites were males with ovaries or females with testes, and we didn't know what happens when these animals grew up. What happens when these hermaphrodites become adults? The problems are, one, they don't have sex chromosomes, so it's difficult to know who's who, but I'll tell you now we know the answer. And the other problem is it takes these animals about four to five years to grow up, right? So you got to get an undergraduate when they're a freshman and say, you know, maybe by the time you graduate, we might have something for you to publish. In fact, it took eight years for us to, for us to figure it out. And, and I'm very happy. I, I look, when I went to save my Beyond Pesticides talk last night, it said, file already under this name. Do you want to replace it? which made me remember I'd spoken at Beyond. And I'm happy to say I looked at it, and, and I'm talking about different stuff this time. So we've progressed. 
So this was not the last time, and the last time I spoke. So this is from a fairly recent PNAS paper. And what we discovered was that when some of these, when these hermaphrodites grow up, they actually completely convert to females. And so, for example, eight years later, after we finally published the work, we have a gene that's expressed in females that does not exist in males. So, for example, we can tell for sure. You see the guy who looks like he's, he's smiling there? You, you, you can guess what he's doing. He's hurt his leg, and this one's giving it a ride home. Um, <laughs> the, the guy who's helping him out is his, his brother. So we figured out that about 10% of the males that are exposed to atrazine completely turn into females. So they lay eggs and everything. Other than the genetics, you cannot tell them from normal genetic males. So they're completely converted into females. They make enough estrogen that they completely convert. In fact, he is a grandmother now, right? That's not something you hear every day. So he is a grandmother. The other things that we did was I wanted to know what happened to the other 90% of the males? Because I had tenure at this point. I could take the time to figure out the whole story. And so we did these real simple experiments that I call the pool party experiments. And these are experiments where we put in females, and then we put in four unexposed males and four atrazine-treated males. And guys are thinking, those aren't the kind of odds that I like in the club. But, at, but the idea was to see if these guys could compete. If the atrazine-treated males, the ones that didn't turn into females, are they otherwise normal? And so it was a real, real, real simple behavioral tests. We put them in the pools at 7 p.m. The lights go out, and then the next morning, we just look at who got lucky and who didn't. And there's surgical stitching in there so we can tell them apart. Otherwise, we don't know. So it turns out that you do these trials over and over and over again, and it turns out the atrazine-treated males almost never win. So even though they didn't turn into females, let's just say they're not competitive as males. So I'm an endocrinologist. I study hormones, so I have to do more than observe behavior. We've measured their testosterone levels. And as you might guess, the controls have a lot more testosterone on average than the atrazine-treated males. What's more important is if you look at who made the love connection in these trials, it turns out there's kind of a threshold. And most of these atrazine-treated males just don't have the testosterone. And we don't know if that means that the females don't like them or if these guys just beat them up and they don't have access to the females. All we know is by the time the morning comes, these guys with the low testosterone lose. And then we did another series of experiments that I often call the Motel 6 experiments. In this case, we just put animals alone with females and asked, can you perform in the absence of competition? We know you're not competitive, but are you competent? And the way we measure competency is <laughs> you can't really do like a sperm count in frogs because they don't have a bolus ejaculate. They, you know, we can talk about that later. It's, it's lunchtime. So the way we assess that is we leave them alone in the motel room overnight, and then we collect the eggs, and we just look at how many eggs they fertilize. So this is a measure of fertility, and it's a real complicated assay. So here's an unfertilized egg. These eggs are developing, and, and, and the way you get your results is you just have an undergraduate sit there and go, one, two, three, four. <laughs> Make sure they can count well. Math majors, important. When you do that, control males fertilize about 85% of the eggs, and atrazine-treated males only about 15%. So there's a clear difference in their fertility. So they're not only are they not competitive, they're not competent. It turns out they're not competent for two reasons. One is they don't even try. So if you observe them, they sit there and they watch the females lay eggs. So they don't even, as the young people say, they don't even bust a move. They don't even try, throw a line out there, so to speak. The other thing is even when they do, if you look at their testis under the microscope, okay, you find out that the control males, here's a testicular tubule, are full of sperm, whereas the atrazine-treated males have testicular tubules that are basically empty with a little bit of cellular debris. So they don't have enough testosterone to show behavior, and even when they do, they don't have enough testosterone to maintain their sperm. So, so again, that's bad news. Bad, bad news for the company, good news for me. So here's another PNAS paper. Atrazine induces complete feminization and chemical castration in male African clawed frogs. And again, I, I like to put words in the titles that, that make them unhappy. That's just the kind of brother I am, I guess. So then we asked some other questions. Is this just specific to African clawed frogs, or might all frogs be susceptible to this atrazine stuff? And we looked at North American leopard frogs, and here's, here's testis, so this is the gonads dissected out. And these are, I usually refer to this as the junk in the trunk. 
These are actually eggs that are bursting through the surface of this male's testes. Now, at this point, I started interaction, interacting with the Environmental Protection Agency. And this work was eventually published in Nature, another one of those, I got promoted to full. You know, I, I, I sent to the EPA, and I, and I still have the email. They wrote back, and they said, well, this is an interesting finding, Dr. Hayes. However, we do not think it is an adverse effect that would trigger review and regulation of the chemical. <laughs> right? Because my wife tells me that there is nothing more painful in life than childbirth. And as I tell people, based on the G.I. Joe Kung Fu grip she had on my hand when my son was born, I got to take her word for it. I'm in her nodding. But fellas, <laughs> a dozen chicken eggs in your testicle. Doesn't that seem like it should be somewhere in the top five? <laughs> right? The EPA says it's not an adverse effect. I don't know. I guess we got to trust her. So the next thing we did was we wanted to know if these effects occurred in the wild. That's the other reason we studied the North American leopard frog. Is this a laboratory artifact or not? So here's a testis, and this is now an animal collected from the wild. And I'm going to show you what's called a transverse serial cross-section. So just imagine I'm slicing a salami. I fold out a slice. The color's different because of the stain we use under the microscope. And I blow that up, which is what the microscope does. And so here are testicular tubules, but these are eggs instead of sperm. So this is in the real world. In the real world, these animals are growing eggs in their testis instead of sperm, just like we see in the laboratory. So we did a study. Here's where most of the anthracene is used in red. This is a color-coded map. And we did a study where, you know, I always be obnoxious, and I say, well, we controlled for latitude. But this is Highway I-80, and we were driving to a conference in Indiana. <laughs> and, and we collected frogs along the way. And, it, see, and got a nature paper. That's fuel efficiency. <laughs> and so it turns out, Every place we find hermaphrodites, we find atrazine and vice versa. And the reason this got published in Nature, this is important, and you just heard about correlation, not showing cause and effect. So this is just correlation, except that we had the lab data to back it up. We knew that we could take frogs from here and raise them in the lab in clean water, and they wouldn't become hermaphrodites. And we could take frogs from here and put them in atrazine, and they would become hermaphrodites. So we knew it wasn't natural variation, and we knew it was more than a correlation. And so we got, we got the big, a bigger publication out of it. The next kind of question we want to ask, and this is a shot over Nebraska from the plane, is, is what a, how important is atrazine, right? I mean, that's what we were focusing on, but how, how important is it really? And the reason I was concerned is because they're not just using atrazine. They're using all these herbicides, all these fungicides, and all these insecticides, and that's just on one of those squares that you're looking at. Each square is using a different set. And so we did a huge experiment that I won't bore you with where we looked at all of these compounds individually or in combination, and, and it turns out, well, I'll show you. It turns out we also looked at other interactions. So we showed that there are other factors that can affect development. So, for example, if the temperature goes up, that's a stressor. If the pond dries up, that's a stressor. If the tadpoles become crowded, that's a stressor. That, that may have nothing to do with us, not very likely, right? Agriculture contributes to climate change contributes to desiccation and loss of surface water, which leaves the animals crowded. That crowding causes an increase in stress hormones, but we also showed that these mixtures of pesticides, which are more concentrated as the pond dries up, also contribute to increases in stress hormones, and that causes the release of pesticides stored in fat, which effectively increases stress hormones even more. So there was this incredible nasty interaction, and that resulted in damage to the thymus, or to the immune system, which caused animals in the lab to develop meningitis, in response to a flavobacterium and caused high parasite loads in the kidney and the liver in the field. So we had this incredibly important interaction between stressors, for example, which if I didn't have the lab data and the field data, you would never guess why these populations were disappearing. You'd think it was disease, but in fact, pesticides and other stressors were playing an incredible role in terms of determining how susceptible the animals were to disease. And by damaging the kidney and the liver, you effectively increase the pesticide load because now you've damaged the organs that are supposed to metabolize and get rid of the pesticide. It was an incredibly nasty interaction. The last frog story I'll tell you is that, before we get to the story of the tale of toads and men, is that we wanted to test this in a more sort of experimental paradigm in the field. And we were able to do so on the Salinas River. How many people know about the Salinas? How many people have eaten something from the Salinas? Every day, I guarantee you. 85% of the country's lettuce comes from this. This is about a two-hour drive. Very intense agriculture. 
The river flows south to north. Most of the agriculture is up at the north. I mean, this created an incredible experimental regime for us because in the same river, we could go to Santa Margarita, where the water's all nice and pristine, a foot and a half deep, 20 degrees Celsius. That's where rich people from Monterey get their water from. We can go downriver where there's no water because it's all being drained off for agriculture downstream. And here, the tadpoles don't have pesticides, but that's what's left of the river right there. That's about 3,000 tadpoles in an inch of water at 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So they're crowded and they're hot. They're stressed, but no pesticides. Further down, the water's back. It's a foot and a half deep, 20 degrees Celsius, just like down here, except 100% of that water is agricultural runoff. So we could do a really neat experiment where we started upstream and we just collected tadpoles at those three sites. Here's what I want you to get. This is an animal. These are the same developmental stage, same age, same species, same river, collected on the same day, about two hours apart. The only difference between this tadpole and these is that this one is one from one of those little crowded hot pools. And the only difference between this one and this one, same river, same temperature, same amount of water, is that this tadpole is living downstream of water that's running off the lettuce, the food, the garlic, the strawberries, the artichokes that we're eating. The only difference is that this one lives downstream of agriculture. Same river, same age, same stage, same species. So here's the spot we looked at. So here's, here's where we're collecting those animals that I just showed you. Here's what the river's surrounded by. That's the town. That's agriculture. And what I want to do is, as I usually tell people, is now I want to show off my Harvard, Harvard liberal arts education. Because I want to switch and tell you what John Steinbeck had to say about Salinas in 1952. It's, it's quite relevant. I'm going to go over here where I can read it off my computer. In 1952, John Steinbeck wrote, Salinas was surrounded and penetrated with swamps and tool-filled ponds, and every pond spawned thousands of frogs. With the evening, the air was so full of their song that it was a kind of roaring silence. It was a veil, a background, and its sudden disappearance, as after a clap of thunder, was a shocking thing. It is possible for the night that frog sounds should have stopped. Everyone in Salinas would have awakened feeling that there was a great noise. In their millions... The frog song seemed to have a beat and a cadence, and perhaps it is the ear's function to do this, just as it is the eye's business to make stars twinkle. Here's what Selena sounds like now. There's a single native frog call in that river in the five years that I've been working there, downstream. And my, my point of bringing this up is, that's not a piece of scientific literature. There's no scientists. There was no science going on, but the frogs and their millions and their song was such a part of the landscape that a literary artist wrote about it in 1952. A literary artist wrote about it. It was such a part of the landscape. Now it's silent night. The reason I include it in there because it shows you what an impact. We introduced atrazine and other pesticides starting about 1958 to Salinas. And I'm not going to tell you that the frogs are gone just because of atrazine and pesticides, but this is a paper I published with my graduate students, the five ultimate causes of amphibian decline on the river and otherwise, we think, are introduced pathogens. Those are important, but we know that there's an interaction with pesticides. Atmospheric change, that's a stressor that we know is having an interaction. Habitat modification or loss, we know that's a reality when you build a farm, you, right? And invasive species, which also come along with agriculture. But these pesticides are playing an integral role with these other factors that we think is incredibly important. Oh, these are what I call words from my former sponsor. I can't bring myself to say them out loud, so you can read them. Different perspectives. Yeah. So the reason I call this from Silent Spring to Silent Night, and I know you know all about Rachel Carson, I talk to many young people who don't, is because in much the same way that Rachel Carson taught that our Silent Spring and the birds disappearing and the role of pesticides was telling us something about ourselves, I believe that our pending silent night or our silent night that's already come in many places are also telling us something about ourselves. Over 70% of all amphibian species are in decline. This is a group of animals that have been around since the days of the dinosaurs, and we're losing species now faster than the dinosaurs disappeared from them. The sixth mass extinction, many people believe that is the first time that a mass extinction on Earth will be caused by a single species. You've also heard about the connections between environmental health and public health. This is my favorite slide to illustrate that. 
This is a place in Nabugabo in Uganda where I used to work, where the runoff from this crop, which goes into these containers, is the sole source of cooking, bathing, and drinking water for this village. And I use it because they don't have a fancy EPA or an FDA in this village. But if I tell, told these guys about the poor health of animals in the water, like I've been showing you, the connection between environmental health and public health is clear. But we live in this, here's my village, my water just comes from there. It's no different, except that we don't have to take a yellow bucket up there and get the water, and we make these assumptions that we have these agencies that are protecting us from chemicals like atrazine, so nothing bad would be in our water. Well, like I said, I'm preaching to the choir. Most other people I talk to think that. A colleague of mine wrote in Echoepidemiology, the occurrence of an association in more than one species and species population is very strong evidence for causation. Now, what I've told you about is more than one species, it's multiple, or more than one population, but multiple species generate families of frogs. And I've told you about more than just correlation, I've told you about experimental evidence supporting the impacts of atrazine and pesticides on amphibians and their declines. What's more, though, is it's not just frogs. I'm going to show you that there are data in fish, birds, reptiles, and mammals, including humans, that show very similar things. Now, the data I'm going to show you now come from a group of scientists that I've worked with, and actually just this is only half the group. I emailed everybody in the world who worked on atrazine, and we've written a couple papers, in part in response to the industry's charge that's just some crazy black guy from Berkeley claims that frogs are a problem. Now, I'm not denying any of the parts of that. I might be a crazy black guy from Berkeley. I'm fine with that. But my frogs and my science and my studies on frogs aren't the only ones showing that there's a problem. They try to point everybody. They try to detract away from the other science by pointing these fingers at me and making these sort of nasty public things, which some of you may have heard about. So here's one of the papers we published, 22 authors from 12 different countries. I managed to introduce the term gonadotoxin into the literature in this paper. Again, because it pisses them off, and that's just the kind of brother I am. So here are the problems with atrazine, as I told you. It decreases testosterone and causes sperm to go down. I told you that happens in frogs. And let me, everybody I'm putting up here now, all these co-authors, I had never met them before and, and didn't even really know their science. But here's the things we discovered. So here's my frog, sperm in the testes, give him atrazine, no sperm. This is a guy from Belgium with fish. Sperm in the testes, give him atrazine, no sperm. This is reptiles. This is a caiman. It's like a large alligator in Argentina. Sperm in the testes, give him atrazine. They look just like my frogs. This is rats. This was done in Croatia and in Nigeria. This is all peer-reviewed, published data. Testicular tubules with sperm, give them atrazine, no sperm. And this is a new colleague from Pakistan who's shown you take quail, they have sperm in their testes, give them atrazine. Doesn't matter what animal you're looking at. And you saw the big chart earlier from, from TEDx. Same thing's happening to everybody. The route exposure might be different. And the, and the important concentrations might be different. But the same effect occurs. It doesn't matter if you're looking at fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, or mammals. Whether or not testosterone goes down has also been shown in multiple species. But what's more important now, or not more important, but equally important is my colleague Shauna Swan from Sinai showed the following. If you look at men in Columbia, Missouri, what she calls subfertile men have about 0.1 parts per billion atrazine in their urine. So men who have low sperm count, who can't get their wives pregnant, have about as much atrazine as their urine, in their urine as it takes us to chemically castrate a frog. Now, that's just correlation. But remember that atrazine knocks out testosterone and sperm in fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and rats, mammals like us. What's more is now, if you squash the data down, so I've, just, I've done a fancy PowerPoint trick. Here's some data from California. So these aren't my data. This is somebody else's data. I don't even know this person. But they showed that here are levels of atrazine in field workers. And now here are atrazine levels in men who apply atrazine. Men who apply atrazine have 2,400 parts per billion atrazine in their urine. That's 24,000 times higher than we know is associated with low fertility in men in Columbia, Missouri. Men who apply atrazine have 24,000 times the atrazine in their urine than we use in the laboratory to chemically castrate frogs and fish. One of these guys could pee in a bucket. I could dilute it 24,000 times. I could use the atrazine in their urine to chemically castrate and feminize 24,000 buckets of 30 tadpoles each. Now we're getting into, and I won't, I won't even go into it here because, again, I'm preaching to the choir, a segment of our population that we already know there's a health disparity. There are health disparity outcomes, and you name the disease. For black people, it's everything except broken bones. We've got strong bones. But in any kind of health, any kind of health condition, cancer, you name it, black, 
and Hispanics are at greater risk and usually have poor outcomes and are more likely to live in and work in areas where they're exposed to chemicals that we know are associated with these same illnesses. A former sponsor feels different. So does atrazine turn on aromatase and increase estrogens? We're not going to worry about egg production in mammals. That's not going to happen. But what you worry about for estrogen and aromatase in mammals is breast cancer and prostate cancer. Two of the top cancers, I think lung cancer comes up and peeps up and tops these every now and then, but two of the top cancers that are of concern. With regards to prostate cancer, there's an 8.4-fold increase in prostate cancer in men who work in their factories and bag atrazine. They published this. This was done in their own factory. I didn't publish this. They published this from their own factory. San Gabriel, Louisiana. With regards to breast cancer, there's at least one correlational study that shows with a p-value of 0.0001, women whose well water is contaminated with atrazine are more likely to develop breast cancer than women who live in the same community but don't drink the well water. And this work was done in Kentucky, which is where I was yesterday, or two days ago. And they got to look at those data. Again, I didn't publish that. That's just a correlation, but if you look at rats, testosterone goes down when you give them atrazine, and estrogen goes up, just like I've told you for fish and frogs and birds and reptiles, now rats, mammals like us. What's more is their own studies showed in 1994 that if you give rats atrazine, there's an increase in breast cancer and mammary cancer in rats. Didn't do this. They did. They published this themselves. Somebody mentioned earlier, what about mechanism? As I told you, half my talk was done earlier. What about mechanism? The mechanism is the following. We've published two papers, but I'm going to show you a paper published by their own scientists where they took human cells, these are adrenal cells, and they normalized aromatase and estrogen production to one. And if you give these human cells atrazine, they express aromatase and they start making estrogen. Like we've shown in fish, just like we've shown in amphibians, just like they've shown in reptiles, just like they've shown in rats, Lo and behold, human cells respond the same way. So now you have a mechanism to go along with your experimental evidence in your rats to go along with your correlational evidence for breast cancer. What's more is one of my graduate students has shown that if you take breast cancer cells and give them atrazine, they start expressing aromatase and making estrogen. Breast cancer cells. Now, here's why that's important. Breast cancer, you already heard how hormones work. There's a lock and key mechanism. So here's the estrogen receptor. You already heard earlier today that cancer often involves mutations in the DNA. But that's not really what gives you cancer. What gives you cancer is that when this cell grows and divides and spreads. That's what cancer is. It turns out that aromatase, which I talked about earlier, is expressed in those cells around the breast cancer when you get it typically. Otherwise, think about it, right? Most women get breast cancer after menopause when your estrogen levels are lower than they've ever been in your life. How can that be? That's because, one, breast cancer incidence depends on your lifetime exposure, which you already heard about earlier today, and it depends on this local expression of aromatase. In fact, aromatase expression is so important in causing that cancer to grow. You make your own estrogen. It binds to the receptor and causes the cell to divide. That who knows what the number one treatment for breast cancer is right now? The chemical called letrozole that knocks out aromatase and decreases estrogen so that those cells, when the DNA is damaged, don't turn into a tumor. How much sense does that make when the number one contaminant, which you already heard today, of drinking water, bathing water, groundwater, surface water, rainwater, does exactly the opposite in every animal that's been examined and is associated with breast cancer in humans and promotes and induces breast cancer experimentally in rats? Here's where I get in trouble. The same company that's given us atrazine since 1958, now makes letrozole. See, I'm not making this up. You can Google it. Novartis Oncology offers treatments for cancers. So the same company that gives us 80 million pounds of an aromatase inducer that promotes breast cancer in rats that's associated with breast cancer in humans now gives us letrozole to knock out aromatase to basically, I would argue, undo what it did. In fact, I wrote a paper called The One-Stop Shop, Chemical Causes and Cures for Breast Cancer. They got real upset. They sent a lawyer to my university. Oh, it was awful. In addition, you already heard about this. Here are the problems. Here are the, here are the giants that we're all facing. And again, I'm preaching to the choir. One is the same company that makes the pesticides that cause the environmental problems make the pharmaceuticals. And not only that, the chemical companies make them own 90% of the seeds. And this is a diagram showing the big five are here. 
the size is showing how their, their relative influence. And these are all the seed companies that they're connected to. 90% of the seed are owned by the companies that make the pesticides, that make the pharmaceuticals, that not only want you dependent on their seed, but because they're ultimately owned by chemical companies, they want you dependent on the chemicals as well. Here's the other big part of the problem, which you've already heard about today. That's the FDA. Here's my friend, Kloas Werner. Guess what he does? First, he worked for the EPA in the scientific advisory panel reviewing my work for atrazine. Then he turned around and got paid by Syngenta, published papers with Syngenta, and now is back working for the EPA simultaneously. Now, there, are the, there are the problems. I would argue that my love and study in this aquatic organism has told me quite a bit about this aquatic organism, that the things that we're studying in frogs are relevant to the things we're studying in humans. Some might question that, but I would argue that my tadpole, trapped in a contaminated aquarium, trapped in a contaminated pond, is no different than this organism, trapped in a contaminated amniotic fluid, dependent on the same hormones as my frog. And studies now show that we're exposed to over 300 chemicals before we leave the womb, most of which we have no idea what they do. We use rats to get things on the market, but the industry argues that rats aren't humans, and so we can't use those studies to get things off the market. Atrazine causes prostate and mammary cancer in rats. It causes immune failure in rats, which we've also shown in frogs. And these are all published data. It causes neurodamage in rats when pregnant mothers are exposed. And here now is the work that changed my life, not my work. This is published in the literature. An EPA lab showed that if you give pregnant rats atrazine, it'll cause an abortion. It creates such a hormone imbalance that the rats can't maintain the pregnancy. A second EPA lab showed, this is all peer-reviewed and published, that if those rats that don't abort, the sons are born with prostate disease. A third EPA laboratory showed and published that if those rats that don't abort, the daughters of the exposed mothers are born with poor breast development, and essentially their offspring have retarded growth and development because they can't make enough milk. Here's what changed me profoundly from a little more than a boy who likes frogs. This rat was affected by atrazine that its grandmother was exposed to. This rat never saw atrazine. This rat was affected by atrazine that its grandmother was exposed to. When I think about my little girl, it gives me a whole different vision for myself, right? We, we publish in the, in, the, in, the, in the ivory tower, PNAS Nature, these things that mean so much to our promotion and our academic colleagues. We're publishing in places that 99.9% .9 of the world don't have access to. My mom once asked me, how important is that magazine if I can't get it in Barnes & Noble? I, I, I never thought about it that way. Our grandchildren could be affected by chemicals that we're using today. Our granddaughter's granddaughter could be affected by chemicals that we're using today. You already saw this graph earlier. I was going to show it to you. I'll show it to you again. That is not just some imaginary thing. I've told you that there are birth defects in rats, but there's a correlation between birth defects and conceptions that occur during peak atrazine. What's more is, and this came, about, came out about two years ago. Let me read to you their conclusion, and this was published by the Center for Disease Control. Maternal exposure to surface water atrazine is associated with fetal gastrothesis, particularly in spring conceptions. Now, I never heard of that condition. I can't, even, I can't even pronounce it, but I can show you what it looks like. Here's another one that just came out a couple months ago, and this is a report from the National Institutes of Health. And let me read to you. Their conclusion was that maternal exposure to a common herbicide atrazine is associated with nearly twofold higher risk of having offspring with a rare birth defect of the nasal cavity, coenal atresia. Again, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, but here's what it looks like. These are just correlations. Right? That's what you hear. Oh, it's just a correlation. But I've shown you the evidence and everything from fish all the way up to rats who are supposed to represent us. That profound change has, has, that I talked about has been manifested in many ways. I was told when I got involved in this, don't be an advocate, Tyrone. Let the science speak for itself, my PhD advisor said. And, and for many of us scientists in the ivory tower, that's, we take that attitude because, that, because that's how, we how we're taught. But when the manufacturer says stuff like this, when they say stuff like this, and Gent assumes no obligation to update forward-looking statements to reflect actual results. That's on their website. 
right? Like one, who says shit like that? And when the EPA says things like this, this was in a news uh, press release, the ultimate decision, and they were talking about my work, is much bigger than science. It weighs in public opinion. And so when I thought about this idea of letting the science speak for itself, when in fact all of my science was being spoken in PNAS, in nature, in places that don't have access to the public, then I knew that I had a completely different responsibility. One, as an academic scientist, but two, to make sure that information is available wherever it's needed and whoever would tolerate me for 30, 40 minutes to talk about. So now I have a different philosophy. I love my advisor, but I think times have changed. He said, this other person, those who have the privilege to know have the duty to act. I figure I didn't grow up privileged, I can assure you, but I've had the benefit of some really fancy education, and I know what's going on, I believe. Those who have the privilege to know have the duty to act. I wish more of my colleagues would follow that philosophy. This guy said that, by the way. Stay up Thanks here. for having me. Stay up here for a second. Won't come as a surprise to any of you that uh, Tyrone will be the recipient uh, this year of the Beyond Pesticides Dragonfly Award. And I'd, I'd like to read to you what, what we say here. This is the Beyond Pesticides Dragonfly Award in honor and appreciation of Tyrone Hayes, University of California, Berkeley, for tireless dedication advancing research, knowledge, and action to protect health and the environment.